Matthew 24, <clears throat> our topic is the parable of the faithful versus unfaithful servant. The parable of the faithful versus the unfaithful servant. And I'm going to read it in its context a little bit. So we're going to start at verse 35. I'm sorry, verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the day is of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. <clears throat> and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready for the, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And then verses 45 to 51 are our parable for today. We'll look at this this morning and this afternoon. <clears throat> Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now flip over to Luke 12. We're just going to look at the parallel. <clears throat> Luke adds a few things delivered on a different occasion. start at verse 46. Same parable, but Luke has a few different things in it, delivered on an earlier occasion. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not for not himself, neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. The story of the faithful versus the unfaithful servant <clears throat> is the first of three parables delivered or directed toward the disciples on the necessity of watchfulness or readiness for the Son of Man's coming or the parousia. No one knows the day or hour of Jesus' return. And the fact that the second coming will be sudden and unexpected are reasons why believers must be spiritually alert and ready for the judgment at all times ready to give an account to Christ for the deeds done in the body, for your life. <clears throat> the emphasis on the first two parables is on the unknowable time of the Lord's coming. 
all three parables emphasize the necessity of a continuous life of obedience for readiness and the horrible or terrifying consequences of not being ready to meet the Son of Man. That's the focus here. Now to understand this parable in the whole section, there are a number of important introductory matters to consider. First, to understand the full import of this parable and the ones that follow, we would do well to note the occasion and the context of this teaching. On Tuesday morning, excuse me, Tuesday of Passion Week, right after the prophetic judgments, parables of judgment, which were directed to the Jewish leadership, and we considered those last, Matthew 21, 28 to 22, 14. And the pronouncement of woes, the many woes of the scribes and Pharisees, which was spoken to the multitudes and the disciples, that's Matthew 23, 1 to 39, all of which takes place on the porch of the temple. This is all given at one time, very lengthy discourse, Matthew 22 and Matthew 23. Jesus then leads his apostles out of Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. They climb up the mountain. They take a seat overlooking the city, overlooking the temple complex and all the magnificent buildings. Then our Lord gives a shocking prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem, Matthew 24, 2 to 34. Do you see all these buildings here? Not one stone will be left upon another. The disciples ask a few questions about when is this going to happen? When is going to be the coming uh, of this, the end of this age? And so he goes through a lengthy discourse on when the destruction of Jerusalem will take place. The prophecy of the end of the Jewish order, which like all major judgments, points to the great and final day of the Lord, the second coming. And this becomes the occasion in te uh, for teaching and warnings regarding the second bodily coming of Christ at the end of human history, the end of the world. Now it's crucial to the meaning and focus of these parables that we understand that Jesus is not discussing readiness for the destruction of Jerusalem here. That is important, but that's not the topic here. And he's not discussing readiness for death, as important as that is, and obviously we could get some application for readiness of death out of it, as important as these topics are. Christians had been warned by our Lord to flee to the mountains, Matthew 24, 16, when they observed certain signs. <clears throat> And believers did, in fact, flee to the safety of Pella in the mountains, the nearby mountains, during a lull in the Jewish war with Rome. And thus, whether or not they knew the exact day or hour of Jerusalem's destruction was irrelevant. By the way, of the destruction of Jerusalem in the days of Jeremiah, he told the people, look, go out, surrender to the, to the Babylonians, and you'll live. You'll go into captivity, but you'll live. Those who did not surrender to the Babylonians stayed in the city and were all killed. Very similar. Jesus warns his believers, Christians, to get out of the city. And they did. It's a fact of history. In addition, Jerusalem was conquered by a slow siege that took place over many months. The fall of the city was not sudden or unexpected to anyone. Now, of course, there, there were deluded Jews. There were deluded followers who thought there would be some mighty deliverance toward the end, but the city was surrounded. The sieges were in place. There was no escape. It was not a big surprise that the city would fall. Moreover, if one translates Matthew 24, 30 properly or literally, according to the Greek, the judgment and complete destruction of Jerusalem is a sign that proves that Jesus the Messiah is in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. He's exalted. He is king. He has been raised from the dead. That's what it proves. It is not a sign that you look up in the heavens and see, but it is rather a sign that Jesus is in heaven. In Matthew 24, 30, our Lord quotes from Daniel... 7, 13 to 14. 
which is a reference to the Savior's ascension and exaltation, not his second bodily coming. Now, full preterist, that is those who believe that the, all the second coming and everything has already taken place, that is full preterist, it's a damnable heresy, fail to note that the Redeemer is going in the wrong direction. And physically, the resurrected and glorified human finite body of a theanthropic meteor is in the wrong place for this to be a reference to the second coming. Okay, remember Acts 1, 9 to 11 clearly indicates that the second bodily of coming of Christ includes his glorified human body and is a descent from heaven to the earth in a real glorified human body. Remember, they could touch his body. He was not a ghost. It's glorified. It's exalted. It cannot uh, ever suffer corruption, but it is indeed a real finite body. And you'll have this true, finite body for all eternity. And our standards are clear about that. The scriptures are clear about that. The full preterist interpretation of Matthew 24, 43 to 25, 46 renders these sections of scripture irrelevant to modern believers because we cannot watch or prepare for his coming. For according to their heresy, the second or final coming of our Lord occurred almost 2,000 years ago. So we want to make it clear, this is about the second coming. It has not occurred yet. We have to watch for it. We have to be ready for it. Thus, full preterists and sloppy preachers want to apply these passages to death. And by the way, these are popular uh, things to read at funerals to make them relevant for the dead. The death of believers, however, is not a coming of Jesus to us corporately but rather a departure of the individual soul to be with him in heaven. And they're different things. Death is one thing, and the coming of the Son of God is something else altogether. These parables are given in preparation of the second advent, not death. Now, once again, certainly we could apply them, in a sense, to death. You better be ready to die. But they're talking specifically about the second coming of Christ. We must keep this thought in mind. For it is a serious thing to pervert scripture and twist it out of it, the intended meaning of the inspired author. Which is what full preterists do and people who want to say this is about death. The topic is the second coming of Christ. No question about it. Which is a literal bodily coming. Which has not happened yet. So this passage applies very, very uh, much to us. After some examples of people engaging in normal everyday, everyday activities by being caught completely off guard by our Lord's coming, Matthew 24, 38 to 41, Jesus sums up the practical application of his coming for believers with an exhortation which becomes the main theme of the following parables. This is the main theme. And this will be the topic of discussion for the last public discourse of Jesus before he dies. And this is from... Verse 42. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. <clears throat> the verb watch, Gregoriette, where we get the name Gregory, uh, whose primary meaning is to be awake. That's the primary meaning. Be awake. Watch. In this context, it connotes not simply being alert or on the lookout for Jesus' return but has a sense of spiritual alertness, vigilance, and readiness to meet Christ and stand before the judgment. Watching, then, implies <clears throat> actively shunning evil and engaging in righteous conduct and good works, as we're going to see as we look at the parables. The verb is in the present tense, indicating continuous action. The Christian is to habitually live a sanctified life with an eye of faith on Jesus' return and judgment. So every day you're to meditate on the second coming of Christ, you're to think about the second coming of Christ, and you're to live in terms of the second coming of Christ and the white throne judgment where you stand before Jesus and give an account of your deeds. How am I living as a Christian? How am I conducting myself as a Christian? Am I redeeming the time? Am I making wise use of my time? 
Am I serving Christ? And this theme will be reinforced and illustrated in the following three uh, pericopes. Matthew 24, 43 to 25, 15. And then it's strongly related to the fourth, Matthew 25, 14 to 30. This section of teaching, by the way, this all occurs at the same time, ends with a discourse on the judgment seen itself, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. This final section on the return of Jesus still focuses on the necessity of living for Christ and his cause. This pericope on the judgment concludes the formal teaching of the Redeemer in Matthew's Gospel. So this is how Jesus ends his teaching before the crucifixion. Remember, it's Tuesday. He's going to be arrested Thursday night. There's a little bit of talk at the, the Holy Supper. But this ends his formal teaching ministry, and then he's crucified on Friday. Prior to his death and departure, Jesus places a strong emphasis on how to live and persevere in his absence. This is how you have to think. This is how you have to live. This is how you have to uh, look with the eye of faith to persevere. Now, interestingly, there is nothing in our Lord's teaching encouraging believers to attempt to determine the day or hour of his return. There's nothing in there whatsoever. Those who spend a lot of time on prophetic speculation or even worse, date setting, for example, 1843, which eventually developed into the Seventh-day Adventist movement, 1913, 1988, 1994, and then of course just recently, in, I believe it was May, 2011, date setting. All of this completely misses the point of the Redeemer's doctrine on this topic. The whole point is you don't know and you can't know. That's the point. So to try to determine the date contradicts explicitly what our, what our Lord has just said. The point is that because no one can know the day or the hour, we must always be ready to meet the Lord. We must always be watching. Now before the first parable begins, there is a brief illustrative analogy in verse 43. The coming of Jesus is compared to a thief in the night. A burglar is coming at an, in, an undetermined time during the night. Now, if you knew that a thief was going to break into your house, of course, it's first century language, and he digs a hole in the wall. Your houses were made out of mud and covered with kind of a stucco. And you could literally dig a hole and break in that way. If you knew a thief was going to break into your house in the middle of the night and rob you, you would, I guarantee you that you would not sleep, sleep a wink. You'd be up, you'd have your, uh, in, the, in the first century, you'd have your sword ready. If it's now, you'd have a nice shotgun ready and loaded and cocked, and you'd wait. You wouldn't sleep one wink. That's the point. <clears throat> if the owner of the house had remained alert, awake, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. And this comparison of Jesus' return with a thief in the night will be used again by Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 to 4, Peter, 2 Peter 3, 10, and Jesus himself in Revelation 3, 3, and 16, 15. So it can be used in judgment also. As we consider these parables, the central question remains, are we alert or awake by habitually thinking about the return of Christ and the final judgment? Are we living sober, holy, obedient lives that are pleasing to Him? As John says in 1 John 3, 3, everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. And then Paul adds this thought. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 to 6. <clears throat> you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. And of course, the context is Paul talks about how 
the pagans like to go out at night and party and get drunk. Things haven't changed at all, have they? No, you don't live that way. You're sober. You're children of the light. You're serving Christ and working and living a sober life. Therefore, be ready. And then second, we've already noted this, the parable in a slightly different form is found in Luke 12, 42 to 46. <clears throat> the account of Luke is spoken on an earlier occasion. In Luke's account, Matthew's concluding clause where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth is, om is omitted. And then we, I read the, the thing that Luke will add, which some commentators believe is disconnected from the parable. I think it's clearly connected to the parable. He's explaining the severity of the punishment. We'll see that. <clears throat> the other, only other significant difference is Matthew's use of hypocrites. Hypocriton in verse... 51 instead of Luke's unbelievers or unfaithful. In addition, the punishments described, uh, Luke elaborates on the punishments of the stripes. Some will receive many stripes, some will receive few stripes, depending on their knowledge or ignorance. Third, the parable of the faithful versus unfaithful servant is naturally divided as follows. Number one, <clears throat> the section of the, on the faithful servant, which contains A, an introductory rhetorical question, verse 45. We're going to be, we're going to be looking at the faithful servant, in, uh, faithful servant in a moment. B, the description of the faithful servant in the form of a beatitude, verse 46. And C, the promised reward for faithfulness. We're going to look at that this morning. Two, the verses on the unfaithful servant, which has A, the mindset and behavior of the wicked servant, verses 48 and 49. B, the unexpected return of the master, verse 50. And C, the description of the punishment of the unfaithful servant, verse 51. So we see in this, par uh, this parable a, a parallel comparison which is designed to place the behavior and reward or judgments of the faithful and unfaithful servants in a sharp antithesis. This is what is set before you. Are you going to be the faithful servant or the unfaithful servant? Are you going to be awake and alert? Or are you going to be out partying and spiritually asleep when the Lord comes? Those are your alternatives. These are the two options set before professing Christians, which result in two radically different outcomes. Okay, so that's introductory. Let's look at the faithful and wise servant first. <clears throat> the parable begins with a question that connects the parable to the previous pericope, and which is designed to spark the interest of the disciples to pay close attention and learn the answer to this crucial question. Who then? is a faithful and wise servant whom the master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season, verse 45. The conclusion to the illustration about Jesus coming as a burglar during the night is to always be on the alert and ready for his coming, verse 44. The word then indicates that our Lord is now instructing his disciples on how to be ready. So we're going to get the how, and we're going to get the why. Why is it? How, are you, how should you be ready, and why should you be ready? One can only be ready by being faithful and wise. Like a number of other parables, we have seen a master. We have here a master delegating authority to a servant. In this case, to be a ruler over his household. The word household indicates a broad supervision over all the other servants. So we have a, a servant basically placed in charge of the household, and he's going to tell the other servants what they need to do. What are their responsibilities? In the ancient world, a wealthy estate owner who had to go on a long journey or was away on business or may have had a second home would appoint a trusted mature slave as a steward or manager 
of his estate. This high uh, level servant would be in charge of supplies, the dispensing of food, assigning chores, and keeping up the estate. In Luke's account, the master makes him a ruler over all that he has. Verse, uh, that's 1244. So that's the situation here, and that's a popular uh, thing we see in Jesus' parables because he's taught Jesus is the master, or God's the master, and he delegates authority to his apostles and to pastors and preachers and elders and so forth. Many scholars believe that the parable is directed especially toward the apostles and by way of application to all pastors and elders that have a special that have special responsibilities over Christ's church throughout the New Covenant era. As Spurgeon notes, he says this, quote, These words describe the service of a minister preaching the truth with all his heart and seeking to give meat in due season to all that the Holy Ghost have made him an overseer. Or they picture a teacher endeavoring to feed the minds of the young with sound doctrine. Or they portray any servant of Christ, whatever his calling may be, doing the work that his master has appointed him just as he would wish to do if he knew that his Lord was coming at any moment to examine it. End of quote. While pastors and elders obviously have special obligations to the church and have more responsibility <clears throat> and, the, uh, and so forth, the church of Christ, the judgment certainly applies to all believers and therefore every Christian has a responsibility to be faithful and sensible in preparation for the parousia. Are you going to be faithful and wise? Of course, wisdom refers to applying the word of God to daily living. Are you going to be sensible about it or are you going to go to sleep? The one who is wise and faithful is the person who is actively engaged in the duties assigned by the master when he returns. The believer who wants to progress in holiness must keep himself busy with lawful duties and good works. Okay, this is not Greek thinking. This is not Gnosticism. If you want to be doing the will of the Master, if you want to be holy, if you want to be sanctified, then you have to put off that which is evil in God's sight, and you have to replace that with something God. The emphasis here falls on active service on behalf of those whom the Master has entrusted to him. The focus of good works for believers in the New Testament is primary on service to other believers. But it certainly would include lawful activities with other people, but the New Testament is focused on the church. If believers are to live like watchmen or sentinels of the holy armies, they must habitually concern themselves with pure doctrine, a sound family life, and loving their neighbor by keeping the moral law. When applied to ministers of the gospel, they are to preach the pure gospel of Christ, teach the whole counsel of God, exercise a thoroughly just and biblical church discipline, and do what is right without consideration of honor, ease, or profit. Contrary to the scribes and Pharisees who were concerned mainly with yeah, a few things. Respect to the community, no matter what even if that meant compromising the word of God and making a bunch of money. They were into making a huge profit. Every Christian must profess and live out the truth of the gospel. The enemies, of course, of doing the will of God, and we'll look at this this afternoon as we look at the unfaithful servant, the enemies are idleness, sloth, worldliness, carelessness, and faithlessness. And uh, modern evangelicals, certainly, uh, one does not have to be actively outside getting drunk and smoking weed. One can be sitting around wasting all their time watching television and go back. There's an excellent book, Neil Postman wrote a book years ago called Amusing Ourselves to Death. How American culture was dying ethically and, and other things just from sitting around being entertained all the time. Entertainment instead of applying oneself to holiness and studying the word of God, and doing something for the kingdom of God. You're here once. You get one life. Are you going to do it for Christ? Are you going to live for Christ? Are you going to waste your life uh, watching cartoons or whatever? Now the key to perseverance and holiness under the great day is to look with faith upon Jesus and his coming and always keep in mind 
of the judgment seat of Christ. That must be your constant thought throughout the day. I have to give an account to Jesus Christ for my behavior at the last day. The biblical Christian is heavenly minded, future oriented, and lives each day with the Savior's exaltation in mind. Okay, he lives to please Christ, not self. The worldly minded fool lives only in the present with self interest and worldly pleasures in mind. Let us eat, drink, and marry, for tomorrow we die. Let's have a good time. Let's party. Who cares about the future? Who cares about tomorrow? There's actually pop songs about that. Now, if we are focused on Christ's coming and his evaluation of our lives, then we must be doing Christians. Doing Christians. That's the emphasis. <clears throat> this is to be like Christ, who we are told... He went about doing good. Acts 10 38. This is to be like the apostles. They were men of deeds, even more than words. This is to glorify God. John 15 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. And this is to be useful to the world. Matthew 5 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. This is to follow the example of the Protestant reformers and Puritans, who although were small in numbers, had an incredible influence on society and culture. In Russia, he's written about this, how you look at the colonial era in America, which is somewhat after the Puritans' high day, but if you look at the colonial area, uh, era, <clears throat> the number of uh, church members and Christians in the United States was actually not that high. I mean, people actually claim to be Christian. Now, today, people are so ignorant, probably everybody claims to be a Christian, most of which have no idea what they're talking about. But back then, people were more honest. And not that many people claimed to be uh, Christians. And not that many people were church members as a, as a percentage of society. You'd be surprised how low it was. Yet the influence of the Christian worldview on culture and society was incredible. Today, the vast majority of people attend church, and the vast majority of people in the United States profess to be Christians. And yet, our society is thoroughly pagan, secular, and antichrist. So, things have changed. A professing Christian who is not actively living out his faith, promoting the truth, is worldly, lazy, and useless as a member of the visible church. Those who habitually and consistently live out the Christian life and are faithful when Christ returns are described as blessed. That is, they are truly and deeply happy because they have placed their, the Savior, they please the Savior, they've honored Him. And they're doing so when he returns. They are also objectively blessed. Because they possess the merits of Christ by faith. And because they receive the rewards of grace on account of their sacrifices and good works done to glorify the Savior. What you do for Christ lasts forever. These are the rewards of grace. What you do for Christ lasts forever. You don't get any rewards for sitting around watching TV. You don't get any... Now, I understand people have to relax. We work hard. You need to relax some. And we can't be doing good works all the time. Every moment of the day. But what you do for Christ lasts forever. Wasting time and living a life of laziness does not get anybody anything on the Day of Judgment. The righteous judge will say, Matthew 25, 34, Come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he will give all true believers a crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 2, 8. A crown of life, James 1, 12. Rejoicing. A crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. 
and a crown of glory that does not fade away. 1 Peter 5, 4. Those who live for what they can get out of this world, Paul says, are working for a perishable crown. Think of all the effort people put into making the Olympics and going to the Olympics, and they might get a ribbon. And they, they might live their life and die, and that ribbon may be placed on their dead, rotting corpse in their casket. And then 100 years later, nobody will remember who they are. They'll be dead. They'll be in hell. But they'll have that ribbon on that rotting corpse. But what you do for Christ, you receive an imperishable crown. Those who persevere in obeying the will of God receive an imperishable crown, 1 Corinthians 9.25. True believers live for Christ and thus store up treasures in heaven where moth, neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal, Matthew 6.20. It's permanent. It's forever. It has meaning. It lasts. In his description of that day, Daniel says, this is Daniel 12, 2 to 3. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is what he says. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. What is wisdom? Again, wisdom is people who study the Word of God, they study the moral law of God, they study what the God teaches, and they apply it to their daily lives. That's wisdom. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. What a glorious promise. Now in this parable, the blessedness is in defined is defined in terms of greater responsibility. Verse 47. Assuredly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all of his goods. Those who conduct themselves in a faithful and prudent manner as they manage all the servants of the household will be promoted to an even higher, more eminent position. That's what's being taught here. You did a good job. I'm promoting you. And this seems to be directed especially to the apostles and church officers. <clears throat> now since our Lord is discussing what occurs in His second coming, this promise must be interpreted either as a symbolic, as symbolic of the conferring of great honors or and or it tells us something about the age to come that is somewhat difficult to understand for us. That there is some kind of delegated rule and order in the eschatological kingdom. That's what he seems to be saying. And there are some passages that indeed do point in this direction. In Matthew 19, 28, when our Lord speaks about the restored or renewed universe after his second coming. And you can consult commentaries, that's what he's talking about. It's after the second coming. He says to the apostles, Assuredly I say to you, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory, you, who have followed Me, will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, this promise obviously excludes Judas, who stopped following Jesus and betrayed Him. It would, however, include people like Paul. <clears throat> the expression of the twelve tribes of Israel probably refers to the new Israel, or the whole church of both covenants. But it's an amazing promise, isn't it? When Paul rebukes the Corinthians for allowing believers to, make, to take matters before pagan courts, before the heathen, he makes a few statements that clearly indicate a special authority for believers in the world to come. Once again, it's a difficult topic. The Bible doesn't have a lot to say about this, but what it does say is intriguing and interesting and points in this direction. Listen to what he says, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 to 3. Now he's just rebuked them. What are you doing taking these matters before the pagans? You've got to handle this in the church. And here's what he says. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you not unworthy to judge the smallest matters? 
Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? But we must keep in mind that man was created to engage in God-glorifying work, labor. Okay, the command to work six days a week was given before the fall. Now, obviously, before the fall, work was something that we would enjoy. It was something meaningful. It was something great. <clears throat> and thus, a greater responsibility in the service of God would be seen by a glorified saint as a great blessing. You've served me well. I'm going to allow you to even serve me more. What a great blessing that would be. This idea of greater responsibility is also seen in the parable of the pounds, where the server who gained 10 pounds is given authority over 10 cities. Oh, you, you got 5 pounds? 5 cities. 10 pounds? 10 cities. Luke 19, 17. So that is the picture of the faithful servant, the faithful and wise servant, the faithful and prudent servant who watches for Christ's coming. He has an eye of faith that is focused on the second coming of Christ. He believes in the whole gospel, including the exaltation of Christ, and he's got that eye of faith on that second coming, and he's got that eye of faith on the final judgment. And therefore, he thinks about that, he meditates upon that, and he lives his life in terms of that, which is to watch, to be alert, to be spiritually alert, to be faithful, so that he knows when Jesus returns, he'll be ready to meet his Lord. That is the good and faithful servant, the wise servant. Well, this afternoon, after a little break, we're going to come back and we're going to look at the wicked servant. And Jesus has even more to say about the wicked servant. This will show the flip side. This will show us the warning. After the positive picture of the faithful servant, Jesus will present the negative side of the portrait as a warning. Well, look, if you don't want to do this, if you don't, if you're not obedient, if you're not watching, if you're not looking with faith at my second coming, if you're not trusting in me coming back as the king, here's what's going to happen to you. So we'll need to pay attention to that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We give you thanks for this, these parables. We thank you for this parable, Lord. Right before your crucifixion, you focused our attention on being prepared for your second coming. You focused our attention on the final judgment knowing that you would be gone for a long period of time, knowing that you'd go away and that people would be tempted to say, oh, he's delaying his coming or he's not coming back. But we know you're coming back. Lord, sanctify us by the Spirit. Cause us to have a love of your holy law. Bend our hearts that we would be obedient for, unto you, that we would be watchful, that we'd be faithful and ready. Cause us to be faithful and wise servants of you that we could receive the rewards of grace in your coming eschatological kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.